Okay, I'm Amanda Coots and I am working with second graders at Alcom Middle School. My name is Jordan McKay and I'm working with third and fourth graders. I'm Kaylin Kravchek and I'm working with first, second, and fourth graders. I'm Jackie and I'm working at the secondary school with eighth grader honor students. Okay, so let's Start. We're going to start with written and second language acquisition. Oops, wrong chapter. We're going to start with first language acquisition. <laughs> and my first question is Do you think language is acquired naturally or learned? And I know this is a big part of the whole chapter. I just wanted to know your personal thoughts. For first language? Only? For li first language. Can we skip her? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, well, I think that it's, I mean, there's, I want to say 60% of it, oh, no, not even, I want to say it's like half and half. There's a lot of things that you just learn naturally, just obviously from birth, you know, you just, you learn a lot of, you learn a lot of words, <laughs> and, and then... I mean, of course, you, you, I don't know, someone else talk, I'm done. No, I know what you mean, like, environment, like, you learn by picking up on other people, like, they're speaking, like, normal parents are always, like, mama, like, dada, mm -hmm. like, always listening, but there's also the things we, like, we get students who don't know how to say words, who weren't in that environment, so that's something we have to teach them, mm -hmm. because I feel like they didn't get it, maybe at home, or maybe, I don't know, because there's other students that have troubles with saying words but that doesn't mean that their parents didn't talk to them mm -hmm. That's right. or I feel like we're continually continually still learning language like mm -hmm. we're still learning new words in English learning more complex words in English like I still learn new, new words and use new words in my vocabulary every day so I feel like mm -hmm. it's you acquire at first and then you gradually mm -hmm. I think it's even I because I think it's more than half and half my own personal opinion, because it was talking about grammar and usage of words, and it was saying, um, you know, you say take took taken. Well, why don't you say, you know, took it? Or I guess, I guess you say took it. Anyway, there's an example where it's like the student automatically knows that's not an option. Mm -hmm. they, they don't. They were never taught it. It's just it kind of ingrained. It was acquired that that's not a word. It doesn't sound. It doesn't, it doesn't sound right. Sound. It's the sound right thing. Um, and then they also, you know, there's that study that says that if uh, children from lower uh, socioeconomic backgrounds um, have, you know, thousands of less words compared to children with higher economic backgrounds, and that's more of like exposure, I think, because if you're usually if you're of higher economic status, usually stereotypically your parents are more highly educated, so you're being exposed to a wider range of words. So I think the acquisition is. A definitely like interesting topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um, so knowing all this in your future classroom, how will you help your students with I use the word perfecting, but I know you can't perfect a student's language, but making their student um, fluent in especially in younger grades, like how do you plan or help want to help your students get the, get all the quirks out, I guess, of their first language. And even like your future kids. Mm -hmm. I'm just like always exposing them to written, spoken, you know, I mean that's easy to do for your movies, conversation, text, and then the classroom obviously having text available, always having those, you know, conversations, teaching them new words always, you know, word walls are really important for that, I think. Mm -hmm. And here they use students or teachers even use word walls here. Mm -hmm. Call them words on the wall, not words <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> or writing every day. I think yeah. Reading and writing every day gets mm -hmm. that like instinct heightened. It's that subconscious doesn't sound very question. Yeah. I think um, it's really important to do um, like speaking in your classroom. I know I didn't. Is there Sorry, we had to move technology. Back to discussion. <laughs> okay, so how will you help your students or your future future children with their language acquisition? Is this a so job question? No, yeah. so that's the second question. Don't look at my questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a secret. Um, I think we were talking about like reading and writing every day. Oh yeah. 
exposure. Anything else to add? Yeah, exposure, meaning those are all the important things. Obviously. Okay. Uh, parent <laughs> involvement from a teacher perspective. Encouraging parents to read to their kids at home, giving them, you know, activities to participate in. Mm. That's something I'm doing with um, the students in Macau while here. We are doing a booklet, I'm not going to in my portfolio, about a parent-child reading journal. And they have instructions in, I believe it's Cantonese, and then, so their parents can read it. And then they do the, they read, and then they do it in Chinese, in Cantonese, they write it with their parent. And then it says in the instructions for Cantonese that they're supposed to write it in their English and explain it to their parents. Mm -hmm. Which I think is cool, even though their parents, not a lot of them speak <coughs> English, they can still um, mm -hmm. talk with, like, you know, they can still practice their English and expose mm -hmm. their parents to it as well. That's teach cool. their parents. That's very cool. I had a student today, uh, she was stuck on a math problem, and of course it's all in. Cantonese or Mandarin, I don't know what to do. And she was like, Miss Cam, help me. And I was like, oh, I don't know what that says. And then she translated the directions for mm -hmm. me. And she was only in first grade. It was Erica, that girl was eating the ham and cheese thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my yeah. students do too. It's I I like it. Well, I don't like when they're struggling to tell me, but they just get so like they want to translate it, and they get so excited, but they don't know the English words. Mm -hmm. You can see the way it. Yeah, they're like, they sit there, and they're like, it's a lot with their hands. They're like, <laughs> and then they're looking around at things to, like, point at, to, like, tell you what they mean. Mm -hmm. But finally, they get it, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got it now. I just think that so, would be so difficult to, to translate something. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, was, I took two years of Spanish in high school, mm -hmm. and I... Barely speak Spanish, and even then, I still have a hard time translating things. So, yeah. I think that's really cool that first grader or kindergarten. And they find ways, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. like you said, hands, or like I've had students, you know, say this whole entire paragraph, it's this whole situation that they've imagined just to explain one word. Yeah, like <laughs> one boy was asking, the word he wanted was innocent. So, he said, What if you got in trouble and he did something bad? But then they caught you and they put you in jail. But it wasn't your fault. And you didn't do it. And he just goes on and on and on and on. It's like, innocent. Yes! Yeah. He's so excited. They do. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, so this goes into like, the next sub subject. Um, so acquiring or naturally learning your uh, not given language. But um, then why is it so difficult for us to learn a second? And I, I think a part of that is that in the U.S. we don't start learning a second language till mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's some in many ways too late. But but my kids here they just get easily. But it's still very difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't. I just it's natural and required, and I don't. I, maybe like your brain works like a sponge, and it's like needing a form of communication, and so it absorb it like absorbs the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or the one that's most common or most yeah. exposed to, and then after like the sponge absorbs it, then it's a little harder for your brain to have a further capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's kind of my yeah. interpretation. I don't even know if that's anywhere close. I wish that we could have <coughs> did, like a second language in our schools like they do here, but I don't know if I I, I may be wrong, but I don't know if we have a language like Spanish would be awesome for us to learn. Um, in our schools, but mm -hmm. also I know that Chinese is a lot is coming here. Coming. So I don't think we know which language to choose to teach our kids when they're young. Mm -hmm. Whereas here they value English a lot, mm -hmm. and so I don't think we have English. It's one. Chinese. It's mm -hmm. English. A lot. It's, yeah, all, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think the most difficult thing, like when I was trying to learn a second language, is just like the structure of things. Like I would get so frustrated with sentences. It was like mm -hmm. you want the subject to be in this part of the sentence, but they want it in the other, and then you have to like think backwards. Mm -hmm. And it's just yeah. like obviously a whole new way of thinking. But I know that was the most frustrating part for me. It's just the structure, just mm -hmm. saying things in the order that they should be said. I think we focused on that so much. Like I was never fully immersed in the language in the classroom because you know it was Spanish and then explaining it. In Spanish and then writing a sentence. It wasn't like talking. We didn't have days where we just spoke Spanish, mm -hmm. like anything mm -hmm. like that, which I wish we would have. Oh, we never had conversations, and yeah. if we would, they'd be like scripted conversations. Yeah. Presentations. That's not gonna help us. Yeah, like having to memorize a presentation and then. I know. Um, I took a year of science.
sign language. And that was a, a frustrating experience, but a good one. The teacher wasn't, was very condescending, which didn't help. But he said no sounds in his class. Not one word of English or any other language. You, it was all sign after the second quarter. So the first quarter, he helped you. The second quarter, you had enough vocabulary to figure it out. And so we would just have, he's like, talk about, talk for 20 minutes. And you can't stop talking, and you can't use English. And so we're like, oh my god, like, what's your favorite color? You know, like, just like mm -hmm. super basic sentences. <laughs> but you had to think about it, and it was more free form. And so that was a good experience for me. And I wish other foreign languages were like that, where they force you to learn it. Yeah. Uh -huh. In high school, um, my Spanish club and I went to um, a week and a half long trip to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And whenever we went out in public and tried to order something or tried to buy something, anything we did in public, we had to do it all in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I, like, my Spanish grew, but it didn't stick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can still, I can communicate when I, I go to Mexico and I can get, get around and, like, people, you know, we figure it out, mm -hmm. but I, it hasn't stuck. And in high school, I, I felt like I was somewhat fluent. And it's, that's not there now. <coughs> Maybe it's because we've been in practice. Mm -hmm. And that probably also has something to do with the time, like when you first started to learn the language. Like these kids are learning it so early on that it hopefully, like the sponge thing, it'll mm -hmm. stick and it'll be there. They've absorbed it all. But yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. I don't remember. I even, like, Donde is Donio? Those, like, you know, uh, you know, like six and seven year olds speak. They've only been learning English, you know, three, four years technically. Technically, and if I was in the Spanish class for three or four years, I think my their English skills would be better than my Spanish skills or whatever the language was. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like in those four years, they learned way more than I would as an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then there's those intensive <coughs> programs like what's that Rosetta Stone, and people mm -hmm. swear by them. So right. they work. But how? Like, there's so many like, gaps in language. Like, okay, you have to repeat it back to the. Yeah. You know, like computer or something like that, so like, language is so, just so mind-boggling to me, like when I was in Thailand, I just kept thinking like, how do people like, take their language and put it, their words and my words in English? Like I just, mm -hmm. I don't, or you went today, so amazing. You went today showed us this picture book that she loved, and she read it to us in English, and the words were in Chinese. She did not hesitate, she did not pause to translate or think about it, she just, you know, flashed, like glanced at it, said it in English, glanced at it, said it in English, no pausing. I'm like, oh, so amazing. <laughs> like, how yeah. are you doing that? Mm -hmm. so I have been doing it. I was so like, this is amazing. It really is amazing. Um, so going off of what we said earlier, I guess I should have brought it up earlier, but it said uh, on page 20 in our text, in the conclusion, it says, studies by sociologists and anthropologists show differences among the ways social and economic groups within a society use language for communication. So I know that all of us will see this in our future classrooms, but have any of us seen this in our current classrooms right now? Like how maybe different social classes or different, I don't know, I don't really see social classes that much, but here? Yeah, because I don't and yeah, it all coming together. Mm -hmm. But have you noticed any different? I know everyone's had a different language. Like, we'll try to get it. Not sure. Have you seen it in every, any of your past, like practicals or being in the classroom at all states or here? What is? I'm confused what the sentence is saying. Yeah, where are we studying? Okay, okay, yeah, so okay. So, so, so like. Social classes or economic classes, middle classes, how, class. they, how, how they talk is different oh. among the classes. Well, that's kind of what I was talking about. Yeah, that that's what I said I should have brought up. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that one study. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when a kid enters mm -hmm. kindergarten, he might know this many words if he's low income, middle class, mm -hmm. or higher class. And, you know, from the low income kids to the high income kids, there's this massive, massive leap. Like the higher you know, kids do thousands of more words, mm -hmm. and it's it's just like yeah, like to us we don't really think about that. You know, English is English, whatever. But when you're from a lower income status, obviously you're using English in a different way, mm -hmm. or you're using a different vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it is. There's different vocabulary. But I mean, here I haven't noticed really any of that. I mean, it would be hard to notice. Mm -hmm. it, I think. Just because mm -hmm. 
somehow with the salmon yeah. dresses. They're all learning English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I have a couple kids whose parents are originally European or something, and their English is amazing, but that's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. not the same. I mean, it's still how you grew up the environment you grew up in has, I mean, so much to do. Yeah. I mean, but back at home, definitely, you can you can notice that. I mean, like what Jackie's already said. It, it's it's more noticeable at home. And yeah. I think, like, some of my students, I can tell. I can kind of tell the family that they come from, like, what language they speak, because their English will be very clear, and I'll ask, like, what language is spoken at home, and they're like, well, English can be, like, Mandarin, all this stuff, and so I can tell when their parents have that influence, because their parents probably help them with their homework in English, or maybe they even have, like, their ama, yeah, or their nanny. Yeah, I mean, I've heard one today that spoke English, the, um, what's her name, Erica? Oh, yeah. And her almost spoke English, and that's one of the first ones I saw, but I've also, you know, met other ones when they're picking up the kids that speak mm -hmm. English. I've seen a lot that are Filipino, and so they're mm -hmm. going to be speaking English to the kids, obviously. So I think that probably, and I'm sure they do a lot of homework mm -hmm. with their parents mm -hmm. and Hindus, obviously. They spend most of their time with them, so they're yeah. definitely yeah. communicating. Well, something that I found interesting that's the opposite of that is Ewan's daughter, KK. Because KK, her mom has a bachelor's in English education, mm -hmm. and yet right now she's the lowest in her class. Yeah, she's struggling. She's struggling. So, and I asked you, and I was like, but you speak perfect English. She goes, yeah, but I don't speak it to her. Oh, she says, it's a, so, did you ask her why? Yeah, I did. I was like, why don't you speak it to her at home? And she said, well, Cantonese is my like mother tongue. It's my native language. So I'm going to speak my native language with my daughter because it's like a mother-daughter bonding thing, as yeah. she said. She said if she spoke English to her daughter, it's not like as strong of like a relationship or as strong of a connection. Weird. Does she practice English with her daughter at all? She does. Like, they'll do homework together. Mm -hmm. um, but Ewan is, you know, also secondary and KK is way down, so she's like, what do I do with her? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting. That yeah, is. It's like a parent's choice. Like, yeah, a parent might speak perfect English, but does she speak it with her daughter? Depends on what environment you want. Yeah. So anyway, that was my two cents. No, oh, that's cool. interesting. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so this is a question at the back of the chapter, but I thought it was pretty interesting. It's question number four on page 22. It says, children's heirs reflect at least two things, that they don't always uh, imitate adults, and that they overgeneralize rules. Uh, so knowing those two, or seeing that those two, you know, reflect the thing, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how will you teach your future students um, if they're not completely understanding the language that you're speaking, or um, they're not completely getting it? Like if you have a, a, mm -hmm. a second language learner and they're just shut off to the fact. Learning English. Well, I mean, help them. It's kind of what the kids do with us. Like if we don't know something, they're gonna try and act it out. They're gonna point mm -hmm. to things. They're gonna draw us a picture. Mm -hmm. They're gonna ask someone that can maybe explain it to us. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just gonna keep trying different, you know, I guess outlets in different ways to just try and you know, communicate and do that. I think that would probably be the, the biggest. I think basically, like, the main idea is that they try to just figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think not imitating adults all the time and overgeneralizing, it's like their little brains, you know, their gears are turning and they're trying to figure out, okay, this rule works for these words, so it has to work for these words. Like, it's like um, when they have, if we learn in psychology, a kid sees a dog, like, okay, it has four legs, so when it sees a cat, oh, that's a dog. Or when it sees a raccoon, oh, that's a dog because it's their, uh, their schemas or whatever that's called. So maybe it's kind of like that with uh, languages. Like maybe they overgeneralize. Like, okay, take, took, taken, okay, you know, they use it with other words. Or, oh, you add ed at the end? I'll add ed at the end of this word if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, their little brains are working. And I see that with my in graders too when they write. They just try to take a guess at what the past tense of this word is, and it's not always right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Or, or they'll try to change a noun to an adjective, so they'll just put like ly at the end, <laughs> or an adverb, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, we're working with adjectives right now. 
Uh, and my students are always putting, like, it's more helpful, but they're putting helpfuler. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. Helplerist. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, say it out loud. Like, you know that doesn't sound right, but they don't, they don't, doesn't doesn't, they're not, it work. doesn't work yeah. here. They know so it's hard. They can't tell if it doesn't sound right. Yeah, it's so hard. That is what's hard, because you want to say, okay, does that sound right, but you can't. And that's what I've been struggling yeah. with. Yeah, because I've said it so many times. Find, they, yeah. you know, trying to find the way to explain it, because you know that it doesn't sound right, and you just want that to be the answer. But, yeah, you know, then we have to dig deeper into what yeah. we know. Yeah, I feel like it's more when they say it aloud. Like, when we say it, or when we're saying it, I don't know if I give it away when I'm saying it, because it might be, like, my facial expression. Mm -hmm. But when I say words, and I, like, tell them to choose, like, which one sounds right, mm -hmm. they know how to choose the right one, but when they say it, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm giving it away when I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. I try not to. I try to say them all. Oh, I think I give it away. I think I say yeah. it correctly. Like, on yeah, accident. All, yeah, yeah, like I say it all together, and then when I say the wrong word, I break it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I do when I'm I do that to too. Or when we were doing articles, and they had to change, so a, and, the, mm -hmm. and they had to change it if it was incorrect, or add it if it wasn't there, or omit it if it was the wrong one. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it would need an A, like, you know, or the concert. Like, she went to the concert, but it actually says she went to concert. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, let's look at this one. She went to the, oh, I just gave you the answer. <laughs> like, my brain so automatically does it. I did that, yes. that today. I was doing game with pronouns. And one of the questions, or one of the sentences says, I'm using a purple crayon. Okay, well, I forgot to underline A. So I was trying to have them uh, change a purple crayon to it. And I was like, hey, purple crayon, the color of it. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, but, but it doesn't make sense. I use a it, and I was like, no! <laughs> so I grabbed a pencil and underlined it really fast. I was like, keep hey, out. And they were like, I don't know. I was like, I use a, I am using, and then they went, oh, it! And so it was really exciting to watch the brainstorm, but then it was also my bad too, so we were, yeah. I, it's, uh, some of those kids, it's pretty amazing how they, they are, are, yeah. <coughs> Alright, on chapter two, which might be a little repetitive because it was very similar yeah. to what we've been talking about. Um, so chapter two is about written language and also second language acquisition. Um, so maybe we can focus a little more on written acquisition since we talked the crap out of second language acquisition already. Well, we're in it. A little bit, bit so yeah, might as well. Okay, so the theories for written language were, is it acquired or is it learned? The same argument. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I can share my own personal opinion and then you can go around. My own personal opinion is that you have to learn how to write, you have to learn the rules. But I feel like once you know the rules, then your instincts kind of start kicking in. Mm -hmm. You know, once you learn, obviously, how to spell words, how to form sentences, punctuation, grammar, then kind of your gut, <laughs> then kind of your gut and how, how you feel about what you want to say kind of kicks in. Um, so you guys can show your Working a lot with students who are learning how to write in English, um, it's very hard for them more than to speak to me. Mm -hmm. Like, which I thought would be, I don't know why, but coming here, I thought that them talking to me would be a lot harder mm -hmm. than expressing themselves writing. Right. But it's just, it's rules, and it's important to know those rules because when they do, if they do want to go somewhere that's not like English or to the university, they have to have it down correctly, but it's so hard to get everything down. Like if my student has most of it down, I'm like, oh my gosh, good job. Mm -hmm. Like, that's mm -hmm. so good. But the teachers want them to get it 100% correct, and it has to be correct. Oh, yeah. And so, and that's, I've seen more from like the English teachers, but I also want to, you know, tell them and give them praise for actually getting the answer right, too. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, in general English, they are focusing just on writing. They're so scared of being wrong. Mm -hmm. But when they speak, they aren't scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, because they, they explain themselves. They just have a meaning, and they want to express their meaning to you. But when they're writing, they have a meaning, but is every single word and piece of punctuation correct? Mm -hmm. It has to it's be right. stress. Yeah. I just, that's what I don't like, and <coughs> I know when Kaylin comes in, when they have a word that they have to spell, mm -hmm. if they get to it, they stop. 
and hands how up. How do you spell? How do you spell? How do you spell? And it's, I really just want to tell them, just, you know, wait. If you don't know the sound, like just write the first sound or any sound you know. Keep that mind, like that word up here, and then keep going. Mm -hmm. But no, they yeah. have to know that I word before stop. they move on. My kids do that too, and they're 14. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a huge problem. And I, the past couple weeks, you know, I stopped giving them the words because I was like, no, I don't need to do what Sui does because Sui just gives them the word. So I don't need to do what she does. So I started doing it different. And I started like, I'll help you. How do you think it's spelled? Mm -hmm. And they start. And then they get, you know, it's like if it's accident, they get stuck on the two C's. Okay, I was like, okay, it's not an S. So maybe a C. Okay, okay, a C. Okay, this is a tricky one. Is it two C's? Yes. You know, like I talk them through it. Mm -hmm. And it's so strange to like see their face. They're like, you're not just going to give me the word. Mm -hmm. I have to figure it out. What? But then they're so proud of themselves when they can figure it out, mm -hmm. which is a little help. So it's really disappointing that they don't do that more. Yeah. I just think that the teachers just get frustrated and they just throw them the mm -hmm. answer so then they can just move on to the next kid that's asking the same question, how do you spell, how do you spell? Mm -hmm. Because that happens all day long. They're yes. always asking for spelling and they won't even try until you come over there and ask them to at least try. Yeah. And I, the hardest part for me that I've noticed is that when you try and look, you're like, okay, what do you think it starts with? What sound does it make? And then you'll be making, or you'll you'll be making this sound, or you know whatever. And they just they can't figure it out. Or you go, okay. So if you know that, like when you're spelling any word, I'm kind of losing my thought right here. But if you're trying to spell any word, and they you're like, okay, what sound does an H make? And they go H. No, what sound does it make? H. Okay, that's not the sound mm -hmm. the letter makes. They confuse that a lot. They, they name the letter with the yeah. sound. They do, and they don't they know the sound, sound though. You make yeah. the sound, and they don't know it. What do they call X's? You guys know what they call X's? It's like, it's, or, no, Z's. 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 They call it Z's. They call it Z's. And I'm like, what oh, the heck is a Z? Yeah, I've noticed that they have more problems with consonants than they do with vowels, because the vowels, like a thrass teacher is what like, Oh, we just, I just learned that word. Thrass? Yeah, I had no idea. Today at the international school. It's only once a week. It's only once a week, and she comes in, and I usually sit in on it. Yeah. And she's only teaching the vowels. Oh. And, which is great, they need, like, they teach them vowels, but they also need the consonants. Because when I tell them, like, S, you know, like, uh, I don't know, or like the mm -hmm. H sound, like, I don't know. And, the ones that they do know are the ones that sound like the letters, like er. Right. They're like R, yeah, and I'm like, okay. But it's still, I want to do that, like, word work with them, and like, you yeah. know, the sounds, but I also know that that's the thrash teacher, and maybe she's getting, maybe, I think she's getting to it, because we talked with the principal of the international school today about it, because she's obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. And what they do is, instead of saying A, B, C, they go all of the combinations that make the K sound. So C, K, C, K, you know, all the cook sounds mm -hmm. together in a family. Mm -hmm. K, all the F sounds, F, P, H together, and they, they clump them. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe she just hasn't gotten it. Yeah. Or maybe they're just too young. Oh, that's maybe, maybe, maybe that's what they're doing in the second term of school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's, that's what it came first. Like, I want to know how they were introduced. That's what I want to know is how they were introduced to English mm -hmm. in the school. Mm -hmm. I think it is through conversation. But then how they started writing, were they just given words and, like, this is read. And I think so. so. I, I think, think so. so. That's so like, yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. This is how you say hello. Or I, I mean, mean, thank you. I think so. Like, they know, like, the parts. They know, they learn a big list of nouns, they learn a big list of verbs, mm -hmm. then they learn the prepositions, then they learn the articles, and they're taught how to put sentences together. Uh -huh. I think that's how they do it. Mm -hmm. that like, when I was doing my I know. When I was doing my words at a wedding test, mm -hmm. the only words they knew how to spell were the words that they memorized from yep. the workbook. Mine too, and mine that's it. That's I had bed, bed, B-E-D, used it in a sentence, and I only maybe 10% spelled it correctly, uh -huh. and then 14. Mm -hmm. So it's like, bed, bed. Yeah. It spells itself. Yeah, and I was like, mm -hmm. she didn't want to get out of bed. They all know that word. I just heard them use the word. But maybe it's not been on the spelling list, so so they don't know how to spell it. Yeah. And they also get it's also a cultural thing. Like I mean, the students I've given students <coughs> in the states 
tests like these, and I'm like, okay, try your best. And they know that phrase. Mm -hmm. They know try your best. And you know that this is for me to see where you are. They know they're not going to be graded down on it. But here, when they're given something like this, yes. it's instantly like, this is a test. Right. Like, I need to show you what I know. And then it's like, shut down, they shut down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I want to know what you know. Try your best. And their best is they have to get 100%. Right. A lot of my students are like that. And Naomi's kids, see my kids, I think, because they're honors kids and they're higher, and I really, really, really took my time to prep, kind of prep them. But she has the lower kids in the lower grade, and they only, you know, out of 25 words, they maybe wrote five, and then just put X's. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah, put X's? X's. Mm -hmm. Just X's. And she would tell them, like, hmm, even if you only know the first sound, ship, 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 you know, you write down the first sound, you know? Like, mm -hmm. towards the end, you're like you're really guiding them. You're like, please, just tell me you know the sounds. <laughs> yeah, that happened when I first took the words their way like assessment with them, and then Judy came in to watch it, and I was just like failing miserably. I was like, they don't know any like they're not they don't know how to sound it out. And Judy's sitting there, she's like, shouting, <laughs> shouting. All my kids, by the way, got the S H. So <laughs> they got it, but it was. They finally got it, and it's like, you gotta, you know, get that to really, them. really prep them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they don't, they're not used to how we say words, too. Well, and like, I do want to say them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, and that's it. this is a slight, tiny tangent, but I was talking to Sui, and I was like, kids can't have that words. Like, the, the phonemic awareness I was talking to Sui, the phonemic awareness is really, is it there in a lot of mm -hmm. students? And she says it depends on their primary school. Ho Kong is a Chinese and math and science school. That is their focus. That's what they won awards for. Really, English is not the focus. So if they go to a, another school in Macau where English is the focus, they teach them phonics and phonemes. It's more of an emphasis. So sometimes we get kids from other elementary schools, not the premier school, or mm -hmm. they get them from outside elementary schools, and they come in and they can sound that word. It's like civilized. Those kids spell it, you know, S I F. If they try, yeah. But then you have other kids who put X's, and it depends on the school they come from, what the focus of the school is. So I just wanted to tell you guys that. No, okay. it's really interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, more with writing, they talked about the constructivist theories, or more of the traditional learning. When it comes to writing and learning all the spelling and the rules and how to um, encode words, uh, what do you think is more effective? more constructivist, inquiry, figure it out, um, use your instincts, kind of a thing, or more, this is the rule, this is how you spell it, memorize it. I think you need a little rule. I think you need mm -hmm. to first state the rule, mm -hmm. and this is how you use a comma, <coughs> this is the correct punctuation. You know? mm -hmm. need to first state that, and with like words and stuff, they need to know all those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to let them try it out on their own, let them give them a piece of paper and say, here, write about your weekend. Right. I think the thing that they talk about a lot in this book is like doing the investigation part of it. Mm -hmm. So sure, you could introduce the rule and then ask them, okay, now it's your job to find out why this is, mm -hmm. or come up with reasons why you think this is the rule for, you know, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Cool. I mean, I think that would be really helpful. I know I didn't do stuff like that when I was in elementary, and I think that would have helped even just with spelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, with, you know, mm -hmm. it was, you know drill and drill. Yeah, it was. Just memorize this word and you know these patterns and things, and then. But I think that giving the opportunity for students to really like start noticing things and like give them a like, real print and say, like, look at this, look at the commas in like if you're learning about commas, look at the commas in this, and then think about like how they're look, using them. Yeah, what parts yeah. of the sentence are they in? Why do you think that's there? Just get, let them mm -hmm. kind of discover really like more, and then you can go back and use more constructivist and be like, you know, army. The more traditional, yeah. How do you feel like your teacher, your own personal teacher, is approaching it? Um, for written language? language? Yeah, for written language. For written Direct language. instruction. Mine has a really good balance. I mean, I'm really lucky. Mm -hmm. Daisy like really tries her best to be constructivist, even if she's really <coughs> needs to. I think she's trying to make it more interesting for the kids, mm -hmm. and that just means being constructivist, I think. Yep. You're making it more interesting for the kids. And they are starting to understand it better, obviously, versus the traditional. Right. Tradi traditional is what the kids like because they're used to 
it being that way. This is the rule, memorize this rule, you'll forever know it, and you'll be good for the rest of your life. Like, I feel like they almost prefer it being that way, but they have more fun when they're doing the constructive. But they activity. know the rule, but do they know how to use it? Right. You no, know, they, they don't. They don't. They, yeah. they know it. They can tell you what a verb is. But how do they pull it out? But how do they do it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think when I talk to Sui, she's more traditional, especially with grammar. Because grammar is just how you That's know. hard. You can, mm -hmm. Basically, she feels like she only can just do direct instruction. Here's the rule, let's work on it for two weeks. That's a lot about with the book. Worksheet, worksheet, too. worksheet, worksheet. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like, that's. I feel like she doesn't want to do that, but she doesn't know what else to mm -hmm. do. And then I teach maybe like a more kind of creative writing lesson. And she loves it. And she's mm -hmm. absolutely ecstatic of what I did. But then she's like, okay, how do I apply that to grammar? Or how do I apply that to this is a preposition, this is how you get this is should, or you should, you ought to, you oughtn't to, you should not. You know, like, how yeah. do you teach that in a kind of a creative way? Do you ever, like, find yourself when you're reading this book being like, I can't remember how I learned that. I yes. can't remember how yeah. I acquired it. And how am I going to teach it? Yeah. Like, that's what I think all the time. But and I'm, I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So screw it, I don't remember anything. I was homeschooled until I was nine. <laughs> I was like, I remember my mom read me a lot, and I did a lot of worksheets, and I listened to just buttloads of audio tapes. My mom's just like, here's a book on tape. Listen to it, sweetie. You know, and I follow along in the book. Uh -huh. And I think that helps me a lot. But like, yeah, it's like you don't remember how yeah. you were taught. No, 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 that's hard. Okay, I have one last question okay. for chapter two. And I found this really interesting that kind of the end of the chapter talked about social and psychological distance. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about, uh, you know, being immersed in a language versus only speaking that language for 40 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, like, what's the difference? And I talked about social distance. So that would be more like, you know, if, if we're in Macau, we talk to each other. We talk to the English teachers. There's a social distance between us and the Chinese-speaking locals. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a psychological difference. I'm a Westerner. Mm -hmm. I speak English. I come from a different culture. You're different than me. You have a different language, and there's that distance that kind of stops learning. Mm -hmm. So I wrote um, about Macau and how there is a different distance there. Mm -hmm. I also learned about how that happens in the States with Hispanic or Asian communities. We have a Chinatown. We have areas like Yakima and Toppenish, and it's like those communities kind of are off to the side, and sometimes they only talk to their yeah, they own community. Each other. They stick with each other, mm -hmm. and we're kind of doing the same thing here in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. So my question is, like, how does that affect your students, and how does that affect language acquisition? Kind of hinders it. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, I haven't learned any Chinese since being here, but I haven't tried to because I don't. I feel like I haven't, you know, needed to uh -huh. because I can just talk to my teachers in English and talk to you guys about homework and then, you know, I'm fine. I'm good to go. So yeah. I think that definitely affects you, especially like if I needed to learn the language, I obviously wouldn't be such a hermit mm -hmm. about things right. or anything, yeah. you know, branch out of it, but mm -hmm. that definitely affects, I think, mean, what you acquire. Yeah. It's kind of surprising that we haven't learned more of the language, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it picked up on. Yeah, I thought we would. We, I told yeah. that I was like, oh, welcome back, you know, you know, big 10, 15 words. Yeah. Because we, so they're so adaptive to us. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, when I go somewhere, if I don't know their language, they try so hard to figure out mine. Like, uh -huh. they know I speak English, so they're like, okay, I'm going to find someone who speaks English, I'm going to find an English something. Yeah. Like, they yeah. adapt to me where, when they go to the United States, it's That's like, That's totally true. I guess I never thought about know this. Like, I'm Naomi, <laughs> Naomi yeah. and I have talked about this so much, actually, this last week, because people here try so hard to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, when I worked at the grocery store at Super One, we would get a Hispanic uh, family that would come in or something, and the mom wouldn't know any English. I did not try to communicate with her. I waved over, you know, oh, Ishmael, the one Spanish-speaking guy in the store. And I was yeah. like, Ishmael, translate. And I took a step back. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, like, slapping myself in the face for it because I'm like, really? I didn't even try? I didn't even try to communicate with them. And then in this country, we are now in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they try And they so are hard. so patient. There's a waitress that we had, and she's trying to teach Naomi how to save her meal. You know, mm -hmm. and it is... It's just like, yeah. we don't do that for them in our country, but they do it for us in this country. Yeah. 
I feel like our culture gets very <coughs> frustrated very easily. You're in America, you're we're stuck in our way. Yeah. And no. this video that um, McCain showed in bilingual, I don't know if you're taking bilingual yet. You guys can get next quarter. Um, so in his class, we watched a video about this boy who um, he spoke English, and everyone at his school basically spoke Spanish. And but he was bound and determined to make friends and talk to them. And like he, they didn't speak the same language, but they were still friends. Like and they got along great because he tried so hard to learn their language. And I was like, I wish I could do that because I would just get frustrated if I didn't know. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know what they were saying, even sometimes my students are saying stuff. I'm like, I still don't want to know what you're saying. And, but it's kind of awesome that you can just watch me and you can pick up on something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like when we were at McDonald's and we were eating Sundays, Kyle's sitting there and he goes, flirting's the same here that it is in the United States. And we're like, yeah, it is. <laughs> so it's cool that you can pick up on things. Oh, yeah. Naomi so said there was like sarcasm on the bus that one. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, she's like, being go ahead. <laughs> driver like closed the door on her and like a different lady closed the door on another lady and she was mm, good <laughs> oh. like, okay. thank you <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. so you know okay chapter three chapter three english phonology all right okay. so like everyone else has started their chapters my first question um do you think or actually, I'm, not, I'm going to say, how much of speech production do you think is acquired versus learned? Like, like when you learn how to make the sounds that come out of your mouth, how much of that do you think you had to be taught, or how much do you think you just baby goo goo ga ga it and figured it out? Ooh, I think acquired, which is weird, because whenever I'm reading, I'm always like, learn, learn, learn. I'm going to be a teacher, I'm teaching people this. Learn. They learn it. No, like it's acquired because my students, I will tell them how to say something a million times, same student, the next day they don't know it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've taught them over and over. I think it's when they're actually having a meaningful conversation mm -hmm. with you that they remember how to say that. Mm -hmm. And they experiment with it and they're challenged with it is when they actually remember it. Right. Mm -hmm. like that makes sense because bit. like I had a couple of vocab words that were tough for them. They had black rim. Like black rimmed glasses or black rimmed oh, wow, yeah. yeah. And that's how hard. black yeah. rimmed, it's bull, the L, they yeah. couldn't say, and then er, they had an L and then an R and then M D E D. Black, they, I taught them every day for like a week. I was like, black rim, say it with me. Black rim, we repeated it over and over and over again. The next week, they still said it the same way. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's maybe a meaningful conversation or maybe they consciously change how they say it without necessarily just being taught. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think it's, yeah. Or like my I think of my brother who had a speech impediment. So maybe it'll you know there's some exceptions to that because he had a really severe speech impediment. He could not say W's, R's or L's. Mm -hmm. So and he had to be taught how to form in his mouth. That would be so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah he would instead of roller coaster he would say whoa 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 stuff. <laughs> roller, roller coaster. He couldn't do the R's or the L's. So oh my so. gosh! And I remember I was his little translator. Was he, he actually needs this. I thought he did. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it took him a couple of years. It uh, wasn't. And he was with a speech therapy mm -hmm. twice a week for two and a half years, three years. Do you know what, like what were the kind of things that he would do? Do you know? They would. I think they. I just know they had. I was pretty young, but they. I know they had. She had like flashcards with pictures. And with the R's, the L's, and the R's, L's, and another one. And he would just repeat it over and over, and then she would like touch his mouth. And just so she was training so, like, his mouth. Train his mouth how to manipulate his tongue and his lips to wow. say the sounds. And it took him a long time. But, cool. but he's fine now. I mean, well, he should be. He's 17. So <laughs> hopefully he can say well, roller coaster now. I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of sounds that like, kids just figure out. I mean, obviously, like, from, you know, however old they are when they first start speaking, they're just making sounds, you know. Yeah. And they're just figuring out the way their tongue rolls in their mouth and, like, the things that they can do with their mm -hmm. mouth. And I think just then they develop the sounds or they're beginning to, and then it's really when, like, they start understanding words more is when they can really, like, fully develop. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speech production. Okay, so my next question, well, kind of going along with that, is um, like I was looking on page 56 at that map of your mouth. <laughs> you know, and this just kind of like blows my mind. A little intimidating. Yeah, and I was just, I mean, I was just thinking about like, have you guys ever really thought about how, how us knowing how this works is going to help us teach? Like us knowing that your tongue should be rolling off the, the you know, the hard plate on the top, roof of your mouth. Like, <coughs> I mean, I guess in cases like what Jackie's saying like with her brother when they're really, really struggling with those things, but I've never really thought about how important it is to know how to explain mm -hmm. how your mouth moves. Mm -hmm. Because like even here, you know, and I say, look at my mouth, watch my mouth when I say it, and I'll go really slow, you know, when I say things, but I've never thought about until I read this how important it actually would be and how beneficial it would be. Mm -hmm. That's so sometimes they can't pick, oh, mm -hmm. so can I, I was just going to say, sometimes they can't pick that up. Uh -huh. and you need to tell them where to put their tongue and describe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to do that in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Told us where to put it, where to, how to use our tongue, I guess, which sounds really weird, but yeah. Much. yeah. I've been reading this book. And I, like, especially in this chapter, I can't tell you how many times I was just making sounds. And like reading words <laughs> over and again, I'd be like, pet, 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 pet. And I'm like, what is my tongue doing when I say the word pet? pet I know it's pet. so interesting to say the yeah. words that they give you, and you're like, <laughs> it's like the tongue twister thing, you know? Um, <laughs> sorry, we have a guest on the door. Sorry, keep going. Okay. Okay. Anyway, give your chapter. Okay. So this chapter uh, discusses that teachers, you know, before previously used to focus a lot on grammar and vocabulary with the LL students and teaching them, like drill the vocabulary, drill the grammar. But now they're trying to focus more on like comprehensible messages. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think that this is happening? Like, are they using comprehensible messages and like more meaningful learning here, or do you think they're still? back with the vocabulary and grammar focus. Like what do you think it is happening in your classroom? Vocabulary. I think it's vocabulary. I think they're trying so hard to break out of it, they just don't know how. Uh, that's, that's why hard, I feel like though. they're using us too, which is why we're here. Right. But another thing that's hard is for them to actually let us do that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think it's testing the gas. Oh, um, yeah. I think so too, and I just think that that's that's really difficult for mm -hmm. teachers, even really experienced teachers. To that's what they're used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. used to a certain way that when you get, and they're used to the same students too. A lot of my students are similar. But not what they're reading, but they think that they're similar with, you know, learning all the things that they're learning so they never differentiate anything. Right. Yeah. Have to. It's just easier to just teach the, the grammar and vocabulary rules versus trying to make it really meaningful and, you know, more interesting, and then they'll be able to absorb more. It's just easier to just go the other route yeah, and be that way. But the book discussed how, you know, maybe if this is just in the United States, maybe <coughs> we away from it. Mm -hmm. and focusing more on making more meaningful. Yes. So, on page 49, I know they had like a quote, and I want to talk about it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so communicating depends on uh, listeners being able to make inferences to fill information that is not included in the message. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting to think about because it's true. We do that every day and we don't even really know that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you guys, how often do you think people infer? Like, does this mm -hmm. happen every time we speak or does it happen, you know, every other sentence or, you know, two, three times a day or all the time? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can be talking to you this whole conversation knowing you I'm sure half of us are inferring while we're, we're listening. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Completely. Like facial expressions and you know how people like will ask questions the other person will answer uh -huh. and then yeah. sometimes they infer wrong and you're like, okay, that wasn't my question. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we do it all the time. That all happens with me and Sui, my teacher, a lot because it's like we'll have this whole 10 minute conversation about a lesson and I understand the words she's saying, and she understands the words I'm saying, but I leave the conversation, and I'm like, wait, what did we just talk about? Oh, yeah, I'm so sad. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it's like 
that that extra meaning. It's like it's not the denotation of the words; it's the connotation. It's like, what are you actually trying to tell her? Mm -hmm. What is your real meaning? Mm -hmm. And that's missed in translation so often. Absolutely. Okay. And I also, you know, have another part of the question, which is, how do you think that affects English language learners? Like all the inferring that happens just in our normal conversations, like being a second language learner to English. How do you think that affects that? Like, do you think that's one of the most difficult parts of learning English, or? I think it's one of the most difficult parts, but one of the most beneficial mm -hmm. for them. Because I can tell when they're talking to me, it's it's hard for them to, they, they focus a lot on my mouth. Mm -hmm. They look at my mouth, and then they'll look at like, my eyes, and my face, and what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I also think they're benefiting from it, because I can tell their conversations with me now flow so much more naturally, mm -hmm. and because they're getting used to how I talk right. and my facial expressions, as well as I'm getting used to them. <coughs> I know what they're saying, and I mean, like my teacher, like her up. Like I know she's saying hurry up, <laughs> yeah. but it doesn't sound like that. So, but I do think it's hard for them, especially with new people yeah. that speak differently. Like the sounds, like this chapter about sounds, okay. they don't speak the way that they do. What I, what I like, am curious to know is where, at what point of like learning a second language does the inferring just like come to you? Like when do you right. finally start to figure it out? And then just you can start to understand. Like, I wonder if that's, you know, in the first. But then with Sui, you know, it's like she has a bachelor's in English. Uh -huh. She's been learning English since she was three. She speaks English better than I do, technically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But those little meanings are lost. So it could be a language, it could be a language difference, a cultural difference. Uh -huh. But do you think the frame doesn't occur, or do you think it just occurs very minimally then for second language? I think maybe it depends on the context. Okay. Or maybe on their experience, on their language skills, the context. I think there's so many factors. Right. And if some of those factors are missing, then they're not being able to infer. Yeah. And if they are getting those in there, because like I think an example is it took my students maybe two or three weeks to understand when I was joking. They still don't sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, because I'll be like, I'll like say a joke and I'll like pause and look at them, blank looks. But then, like the past couple weeks, I feel like they're figuring out my inferences. They're figuring out what I'm actually saying, mm -hmm. and they're picking up on the little jokes or the sarcasm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I feel like it. That also has to come. Like that's why I love working with fifth, six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. because I'm like, I'll say something, and I'm like, I'll stop, and they'll laugh. <laughs> but my second is I say something, I stop, and they're like, uh, what? Are you keep <laughs> talking? Yeah. <laughs> Or one kid will get it, and I'm just like, well, yeah. like I haven't found, like I don't know if it's because I haven't like developed that yet to know when I'm, you know, joking stuff like that because they're younger, but or if I don't joke the way that. And they it goes joke. both, yeah, like you just said, it goes both ways. Yeah, like yeah. maybe we don't joke or we're not sarcastic the same way they are. Mm -hmm. You know, like boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like that to them is sarcasm. So maybe it's that that little disconnect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, what sounds do you think students here struggle with the most? Making with their mouth. What L's. sounds? L's. 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 And R's. L's. Or no, R's are good with R's. I'm They're good with W. They can do Q. 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 Q is so hard for them. To, like, all the time, they don't know how to say it. Yeah. Or when, even when they see it. Because sometimes when they see it, they kind of, they're familiar with the letter, but the Q always knocks them on their feet. I think sometimes, sometimes endings, yeah. endings like ED, ED, ED's, yeah, that's hard. ES's, you know, I feel like I have some specific students that just muddle endings. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or they just get really quiet when they're talking, mm -hmm. so they can't hear the mm -hmm. What was that word? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think they have like a hard time, uh, and I feel like sometimes when we get talking really fast, we kind of, the letters sound the same too when we say these, but I think mm -hmm. B and P, those are hard for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. B and because like, it's a C. Or it's not B, but, but. Um, it's not really the same part of their mouth. It is, yeah, and like even in the book it talks about, I have this part highlighted, the only difference between the and the sound in the voicing or is in the voicing, mm -hmm. and I feel like that is one of the so hardest things for them. If it's air versus if it's their vocal cords. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, that's that tricky. Sense. You need to really think about it. You do, yeah, and I, I noticed that kids here have that problem. So, the, on page 50, 
this just sums up the whole chapter in a nutshell, is the little comic right at the top. It just really, yeah, I love that. I was saying that, okay, so you have your, what you want to say in your head. It comes through you, you choose how you're going to say it, what words you're going to use, how to communicate it, and you're going to spit it out. The sounds are coming out of my mouth right now. Those are the acoustic signal. And then they go into Amanda's brain, she figures out what I just said, and then boom. It gets right. the ideal from Yeah. I mean, that just is this chapter right here. And I really didn't even oh, yeah. look at this picture until earlier today, and I was like, wow, they really summed it up right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, really I don't think I've ever looked at it. this picture. I think I just made it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I saw that, and I was like, click, light bulb. You know, I know, like, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, that was the awesome moment <laughs> for me, and I just, yeah. I just want to that out. Yeah. Teachers, we love visuals. I know, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so, that's chapter. <laughs> okay, chapter four, implications from phonology for teaching reading and teaching a second language. So this one is all about phonemic awareness, which is also something we've been talking oh. about throughout this, um, words, um, letters, and sounding out letters mm -hmm. and stuff like that. The first thing that they mentioned, which they also mentioned in chapter one, is the two views of phonemic awareness, mm -hmm. which is socio-psycholinguistic. Nice. Ooh, and well said. Thank you. And the word recognition view. Um, I personally like the word recognition view because I can, mm -hmm. especially with my experience here, mm -hmm. I can relate to it more, only because I feel that they need, do need more word recognition in order to make their own sentences that aren't repetitive from mm -hmm. what they've already been learning. Mm -hmm. But I can also see the socio-psycholinguistic so, 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 view. What do you feel that your guys' view is on teaching phonemic awareness when it comes to that? I, I'm like you, I like the word recognition. Um, mm -hmm. While reading this, I just kept thinking myself, well, word recognition, word recognition, word recognition. And then yeah. I really thought about it when I was writing my summary. And I was like, oh, you got to have the other two. I yeah. always feel in what I'm while reading this book, there's this side that, I, yeah, I agree completely, but I also agree with this mm -hmm. too. And yeah, I want both. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point gone. I usually want my side with a little bit more, which was word recognition. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I have a question for you, mm -hmm. do you think you side with word recognition because in the States we don't emphasize them as much? I feel like we dice, we do fonts, fonts, phonics, dissect them, here's the letter, here's the sound, here's the blend, here's the sound. A lot in my experience, and they that they don't do it here. Not no, I mean in the states. I'm thinking about in the states. But they focus a lot on recognition in the states. Do you wish maybe that's why you think so? Mm -hmm. Do you wish they did word whole word recognition more? That's why you're here looking at it more. Mm -hmm. Probably. Probably. I didn't think, here, about, I didn't think about it that way, but yeah. Because I'm just thinking that's how I feel. In my own experience mm -hmm. is letters, blends, letter vowels, letter, you know, like right, dissecting right. it to the smallest phoneme. Yep. But that doesn't. But then I'm like, but if they taught me the whole word and they showed it to me as a whole word and used my prior knowledge, blah blah blah, blah I would have learned more. You know, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. I agree. Maybe I don't know. That was just my inquiry. Inquiry. Yeah. I liked how we just uh, did the whole um, inferring. Yep. <laughs> uh -huh. Inferring like here, like that. <coughs> I was trying to see where. I, because I wrote in my book, I see the other side, because I was like, no, I don't like socio-psycholinguistic, I'm like, I don't agree with anything he yeah. says, but I can't remember, it was like, um, something about dialects, I'll get to mm. it when I, like, do you remember what I'm talking about, I started talking about I, dialects? I remember I found that section really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was about, uh, I just have it. It is. I wasn't going to talk about it, but it's so interesting. Because um, dialects are a problem for the word recognition view. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many different sounds and stuff like that. 90 dialect Mm-hmm. And because we all have a different dialect, like, even, mm -hmm. but we can still understand them. Like, English and, like, United States, English and England. United States and England, we can still understand what they're saying, even though they have a different dialect than us. And same with Cantonese and Mandarin, and Mandarin. I was told, mm -hmm. is the symbol is the same meaning, is the same meaning, but things are just said a little bit differently. Yeah. Just like 
Washington and in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the things South. Are, or the yeah. South. Things are said and mean the same thing, but they're said differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That could even be from east side of Washington to west side of Washington. Oh, yeah. Or you can even take it further, and this is a dialect, it's a different language, but usually most North Americans can figure out some Spanish. Mm -hmm. Because they have the same root words, yeah. same root words, same alphabet. Um, it's easier to figure it out and mm -hmm. make those connections. And I can't remember what chapter it was, but the alphabet chart. Mm, the alphabet love that. Chart? Yeah, the crossover. I want to find. I can't remember what chapter it was, but I want to find that for my classroom. Especially uh -huh. if I have a lot of um, oh, Spanish was speakers. It was, was it chapter one. three? I can't remember if it was two or three. This is the beginning of the chapter. I know. It was awesome. Spanish to English, uh -huh. like having them relate the sound like that is what's meaningful for them. Like yeah, instead of them learning our alphabet, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, man, I, I, I saw that, that and I was <laughs> like, oh my god, why has anyone told me this before? It's <laughs> such a simple thing. Mm -hmm. Having the and I never see it having in classrooms. No. Having the letter crossovers. So yeah, the kids have a visual. Oh, this sounds like this in my language. This doesn't sound like this in my language. Yeah, and they can make those connections <coughs> and stuff like that. What chapter was that in? Maybe you know it. Maybe it was later. Was it five or six? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't five. I don't or six. know, but we should probably. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Um. So my question was, how if you could, if you were in charge of your classroom in Macau, which I know that we're not sometimes. Well, Jackie, you kind of sometimes sometimes are. How would you work on phonetic awareness with your students? Would you take the time to work on individual sounds, or yes. would you? Yes, I totally would. Just because you know, I'm working with Jackie. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Are we running Should out? Should we hurry up? My battery is running out. <laughs> okay, we'll just we'll just wrap this up. We'll do this. Okay, hang on. Let me stop yeah. it real quick, and then we'll restart in case I. Hi, we're running out of battery. The battery is dying. So maybe we can send you a little written conclusion because it's going to shut down any minute. So sorry.